So good evening. Uh, welcome to the event cost, uh, bridging the infrastructure governance gap. Uh, thank you for, for, for joining this event tonight uh, in quite a nice summer day for the ones based in London and you know, different. Uh, we, we have quite a global audience tonight. So we're very glad to be able to discuss such an important th uh, theme. So we are living uh, in, in unprecedented times, at least for our generation yet at the same time exciting times in the world of construction and infrastructure. Uh, the global pandemic has led to emergency spending in infrastructure such as, such as hospitals, for example, but this also led to different levels of scrutiny due to the complexity of what was being faced. In the USA right now, one of the most infrastru uh, important infrastructure bills is being debated and discussed in the, in the, in the different chambers. In the UK, a national infrastructure strategy was released not many months ago. All around the world, there's different initiatives that is happening. So therefore, this event is extremely timely. It's also timely because we are going to be talking about the infrastructure governance gaps, so the global investment that we need. But we're going to talk about, about the multi-stakeholder approach and how to deal with complex political envi uh, environments. This multi-stakeholder approach is key how to work with society and different players, not only a focus between governments and necessarily uh, construction companies. And also this event is quite important because it's a joint effort between the Global Governance Institute of UCL, so a university-wide initiative uh, promoting uh, cr uh, cross-disciplinary research, and then trying to debate uh, different kind of solutions for global societal problems, but also together with COST, the, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, one of the leading global initiatives in improving transparency and accountability in public infrastructure. Uh, tonight, we're going to have three main speakers. They all have very distinguished careers. I'll try to briefly summarize them before we start. Uh, in alphabetical order, we'll have Professor Callan, an associate professor at the University of Cape Town and a fellow at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability uh, Leadership. So for over 25 years, he has uh, worked in the fields of democratic governance and sustainability in South Africa and beyond. He has an adv advisory role at cost and governance and most uh, stakeholder initiatives. He has worked with South Africa, Mali, Peru, and a list of different countries. He founded the Democratic Governance and Rights Units at the University of Cape Town. Uh, and also served as a member of the World Bank Independent Access Information Appeals Board and is currently the co-director of the African Climate Finance Hub. More details are also provided in, in our uh, event page. We also have uh, Ms. Evelina Hernandez, a head of members and affiliates at COST. In this role, she provides some technical assistance to the current members of the initiatives, help them design and implement effective programs, she, had, she was the, the manager of COST Honduras uh, previously, and she plays a key role in developing the COST technology, driving forward the implementation of data standards across member countries, and the delivery of the COST flagship infrastructure transparency index, and the adoption of online platforms where to publish this kind of public and private infrastructure data. Finally, uh, we have a professor, Farid, Dean of the School of the Built Environment and Architecture at La London South Bank University and a member of the COST Board, specialized in construction management and economics at project, company, and industry levels. Uh, he's also an alumni of UCL. I'm glad to share here. <laughs> he's also a fellow, of, uh, among many, uh, a distinguished career, he's a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science and has been a consultant to many governments and international agencies on construction uh, industry development. So the way it will be organized tonight is they will all speak around 10 to 15 minutes. This will be followed by a Q&A session where we will have a chance to answer different questions regarding both the presentations and the initiative itself. I would recommend uh, each participant to, uh, that's interested to write the questions in the Q&A box here. At, at, if not, if you're not able to access the Q&A box, there's always a chat. But if you write throughout the presentation, we'll have a chance to review and later on answer uh, every question that's placed within, uh, within the presentations. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Professor, uh, Professor Callan. 
Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much for your kind uh, welcome. A good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you. It's a great pleasure to speak at this event. Uh, COST is, is one of my uh, favorite uh, pieces of work uh, throughout my career. I think it's uh, an extraordinary initiative and I'll try and justify that statement uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of my short remarks. My task is to try and uh, frame what will follow and, and to offer a come, some kind of platform for the conversation that will follow. Uh, I haven't got a PowerPoint and I deliberately uh, don't have one because I would like you, the audience, to create one slide as I speak. I've got three main points to make and imagine three bubbles which uh, come together as a Venn diagram. The first bubble is infrastructure need. The second one is climate action imperative. And the third is the accountability responsibility. And at the heart of that Venn diagram where these three come together sits the governance gap and also the governance opportunity. And that's where cost sits and where I believe cost can continue to play an important role. So briefly on the three main bubbles. Firstly, the infrastructure need. As we all know, this is a huge scale sector. And it's that scale which I think is the significant thing. It's such an important part of the economy. It's the subject matter, as, as uh, Amanda said, of so many other initiatives going on around the world. It's an important topic of conversation at the moment at the G7 uh, meeting. Estimates vary, but at least $15 trillion per year will be the requirement by 2040. In Africa, where I sit, and I greet you from Cape Town, South Africa, 130 to 170 billion billion dollars a year of infrastructure investment is required according to the African Development Bank. A lack of good infrastructure is a binding constraint in many development developing countries or emerging market economies. And at this particular moment in history, there is an opportunity to fill that gap and to build back better to use the motif of the United Nations Secretary General. But I prefer the language of building back differently. Why? And this takes me to the second bubble, green infrastructure, the climate action imperative. The opportunity that is presented, and of course it, it feels inappropriate to speak of a global pandemic that has killed so many people as an opportunity. But the fact of the matter is, that we do have an opportunity now as economies are rebuilt, as the economic recovery plans are executed, and as trillions of dollars of new money floods into the system to boost and to stimulate that building back better. There is an opportunity to do it differently and to ensure that the infrastructure spend that comes over the coming decade, a crucial decade, according to climate scientists, is green infrastructure. It needs to confront in the design and in the execution of infrastructure projects, all of the sustainability issues that, that we face. Climate, socioeconomic inequality, the need for inclusive growth, the rise of fascism, all of these pressure points that are facing humanity at the moment uh, come together in many respects in the choices we make about infrastructure development. The infrastructure development pathway of the future needs to be low carbon, it needs to be resilient, and it needs to promote inclusive growth. By that I mean it needs to create real jobs, sustainable jobs, in a way that addresses the very serious socioeconomic gaps in societies, which in turn are driving levels of unrest and violence and social instability in many parts of the world. And the way I think of this infrastructure development pathway is of a very large ship leaving a port. It's very important that that ship sets sail in the right direction. And we need to give it a nudge, not a particularly big nudge, but a significant enough nudge that it ends up, if it's leaving Cape Town, not in Buenos Aires, but in <laughs> New York. Because that little nudge that we give it as it leaves the port may not be perceptible to the naked eye immediately, 
but that two or three degrees nudge will take that ship into a very different place. That's what we need to do now. We need to nudge the infrastructure development pathway just that much enough to reshape that development pathway so that what comes next over the next 10 years really does establish a very different world in terms of infrastructure. The third point, of course, is around accountability and corruption. As we know all too well in South Africa, infrastructure proves to be a very juicy honeypot for people who wish to establish themselves as rent seekers in the procurement game. Over the last 10 years, South Africa, unfortunately, has been uh, the democratic project has been very seriously threatened by what we call state capture, a project of venal enrichment carried out under the auspice of Jacob Zuma when he was president. Happily, his uh, term in office came to an end in 2018, and President Ramaphosa is conducting a rebuilding project, a reform project at the heart of government. He's having to roll back 10 years of very serious corruption within the democratic state. And the heart of that corruption was in the state-owned utilities of ESCOM, our, our energy utility, in Transnet, our transport uh, utility, and particularly in Prasa, our railways uh, uh, utility. Uh, anyone who visits South Africa will know that working class people tend to live on the outskirts of cities in, in pretty appalling conditions, and their transport options are meager. Train users have declined since 2013 because of the abuse of the system of rail that has been conducted by those corrupt people at the heart of the government. So the impact of corruption on infrastructure really hurts the poor more than any. No doubt about that. It, it totally uh, corrupts uh, in a, and corrodes any hope of serious socioeconomic development in the right direction. So the need to combat corruption and the need to put in place systems that will ensure that those sorts of vested interests will not be able to entrench themselves in the system in the way that has happened in South Africa is a very significant imperative. So how does cost address this? From what I've seen, and of course, I want to sit back and listen to those people who have been working like Evelyn at the front line of cost work over many years. Cost is one way of filling it in my view. Why? Firstly, it recognizes that infrastructure is a wicked problem or that the threat of corruption attached to infrastructure development is a, a wicked problem. It's transnational by often, it's complex, it's urgent, and there tends to be a very treacherous political economy attached to it with defiant and often very ruthless vested interests. Secondly, it requires collective action. No one actor can solve it on its own, certainly not government. Often government is the perpetrator. And not least because of that transboundary nature of the sector. Thirdly and lastly, the opportunity that costs through its multi-stakeholder system of working is that it can bring independent civil society and other professional groups into the game via that multi-stakeholder way of working. And in that, in, in that process, it can establish new standards, new ethical standards, new ways of, of, of organizing decision-making that lies at the heart of that governance gap that I believe brings these three big pressure points together. Big infrastructure spend, big corruption risks, and the imperative to design an infrastructure development pathway that is truly green, truly resilient, and meets the climate science needs of our generation. Only a good system of government that is transparent, which brings all the main actors together, which can unite society with a single-minded sense of purpose and a single-minded sense of common standards, particularly around information disclosure and transparency, which lies at the heart of solving the accountability and governance gap. That is the way forward, in my view, and that's why I believe cost has proved to be such an effective and apt uh, uh, project for this particular challenge in this particular age. So Chair, with those brief remarks, let me draw to conclusion. Thank you for the opportunity to set the stage as best I could and look forward to the presentations that will follow. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Calland. Now we'll follow up with Evelyn Hernandez, uh, explaining a bit more about costs, its different initiatives, and her and her work in helping. Thank you, Dr. Castro. Please let me share my screen. Can't see that now. Can you see it? And not yet. Oh, now we, yes, I think it's loading. If you want to, yes, it's, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to COST and how we are helping to bridge the infrastructure governance gap. As Professor Callan mentioned, COS was established to meet infrastructure challenges. Currently, we have 19 national and subnational members and affiliates across four continents. The city of Bogota is the newly member, and this year we have received more expressions of interest <clears throat> from Asian and Latin American countries to join COS. We also have the recognition and endorsement from different stakeholders at international level. Those include FIDIC, the global body representing consulting engineers and the European international contractors, the umbrella body for construction industry federations in 15 European countries, as well as from multilateral and bilateral donors. We have developed various tools and standards, and I will briefly refer to them during my presentation, including the Open Contracting for Infrastructure Data Standard, the Infrastructure Analytical Dashboards, and our recently launched Infrastructure Transparency Index, which is being piloted right now in six cost countries. We have track record on financial cost saving and institutional reforms across our members. I will show you some examples of it uh, based on the Honduras experience. And last year, we published our new business plan that sets out a program for growing costs and scaling up our impact. But how do we do it? Well, the cost approach includes four uh, core features. The first one is the multi-stakeholder working where the government, private sector and civil society work together, building trust and effectively solving complex challenges like the one that, the one that uh, Professor Cullen um, expressed. The second one is disclosure. Here, we promote the use of the infrastructure data standard or the open contracting for infrastructure data standard to disclose data by procurement entities at government level. And basically, we are referring to 40 data points that should be disclosed routinely and periodically over the whole project life cycle. The third one is assurance. We understood this as an independent review of the disclosed data, identifying issues of concern and providing recommendations to improve infrastructure delivery. The assurance reports offer evidence and they are presented in public events in every cost um, uh, member. And finally, the social accountability feature refers to the development of capacities in different stakeholders to use data and exercise accountability, driving public decisions under scrutiny and demand for action that normally should be translated into practical improvement. But that is the theory. So let's see how these features uh, work in real life. As I mentioned today, I will share the cost Honduras story because first I am Honduran Second, I have the opportunity to serve as a cost manager there from 2014 to 2018. And uh, of course, now as head of members and affiliates at COST, 
I will add some other examples from Afghanistan, Ukraine, Thailand, and Uganda. So back in 2014, the government of Honduras applied to join COST following a dialogue initiated by the World Bank office in Tegucigalpa. This person here that I met uh, at that time, Mr. Alfredo Cantero, he was a presidential advisor, and then he became the presidential commissioner for transparency, who always explained how after a period of political commotion in my country, after a coup d'etat and four difficult years, he, along with other uh, fellow reformers, were looking for international initiatives, such as the uh, OGP, or the Open uh, Government Partnership, the EITI, uh, another multi-stakeholder initiative, and COST, to help the country to reinforce the governance framework. Alfredo and other uh, high-level officials were attracted to COST because of this multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, because this was an opportunity for the government, the private sector, and civil society to work together and meet safely, uh, expand the political space, build trust, and lead a transparency and accountability program. The MSG in Honduras um, has been in place for almost seven years now, and it continues working effectively to promote reforms in the infrastructure sector. Another good example on how different players interact and contribute to an MSG is coming from Thailand. There, the Thai Ministry of Finance leads on institutionalizing some transparency in their procurement system, while <clears throat> Anti-Corruption Thailand is a non-profit organization they lead on civic engagement. Together, uh, they have worked uh, in different aspects and the Ministry of Finance has reported recently that the effect of greater transparency in Thailand and the scrutiny has led to lower bid prices and an estimated saving of 460 million US dollars over the last three years. For the disclosure feature, COS Honduras developed two innovative open data platforms that has allowed to achieve transparency on over two billion US dollars investment um, into the government systems. These platforms are known, the first one is known as CISOs, where the government can disclose data uh, at, either, at each stage of an infrastructure project using the open contracting for infrastructure data standard. This is a standard that we uh, developed with open contracting partnership to encourage comprehensive data disclosure across the entire infrastructure project cycle. The aspiration right now is to connect the CISOs to the national procurement platform to maximize the effectiveness of government systems. The second platform is called uh, CISOs APP um, this has 21 infrastructure projects, uh, so they, they are PPP investments, and what we are using there is the guidance offered by a PPP disclosure framework developed by the World Bank with contribution from cost. In addition, the government of Honduras has shared the CISOX technology with our partners in Malawi and Panama as part of their efforts to reform procurement. To date, through the cost approach, innovative tools and technology, we have supported government disclosure data on over 40,000 infrastructure investments. And what is really exciting is when we have access to open data using these type of standards is that we, de we can develop a picture uh, different tools as Ukraine did, um, designing this incredible platform is an, we call, we call it infrastructure analytical dashboards. And this is uh, turning the data in real time information 
through a series of dashboards, including the regions where the government is investing right now, the, the regions in, in, in Ukraine that are receiving more investments. Um, uh, we can see also who is winning the contracts and where exactly the top five contractors in Ukraine and the average price per kilometer of road. The different type of roads that they have, they have uh, different categories and they have the data um, classified by uh, year and by region. Among other things, this can help to highlight and prompt action on where they might have been low competitive bidding. More recently, this year, we started to roll out the Infrastructure Transparency Index across six countries. This tool was initially developed by Cost Honduras, and we tested also the, the, the initial um, design of this platform, of this uh, tool. And what we are using is a set of indicators to help stakeholders to understand transparency, participation, and accountability within the infrastructure sector in the country, in the region, or in a city where this manual uh, containing the methodology of the index is applied. Specifically, it generates a score for different procuring entities. The index then generates results comparing procuring entities. And then um, with the final scores, we encourage to improve the transparency levels at a procuring, a procuring entity, uh, each one of them uh, that is uh, um, assessed every year. By implementing our social accountability feature, we have learned from Honduras and other countries such as Uganda and Malawi that building capacity of citizens and journalists to use the disclosed data is critical to hold the government to account. For example, in Honduras, each municipality has a citizen transparency commission. Cos Honduras has trained more than 600 commissions with participation of 46% of women as trainees. And they have been trained on how to use the data on the CISOs via their mobile phones to monitor infrastructure projects, including TPPs across the country. Then they can communicate to the MSG uh, the issues of concern uh, using WhatsApp. Um, and this application is, is collecting the concerns from the different um, uh, stakeholders in the country. And then the MSG, the multi stakeholder group, they take forward these issues of concerns to the government. Uh, Cost Honduras, like other members of Cost, has trained also uh, journalists to understand how the uh, uh, infrastructure procurement works. And uh, we present awards every year. Uh, one example is this one uh, from uh, Alex Flores. He works for the El Mundo, it's a, it's a, it's a digital um, uh, uh, media, and he won a prize last year after this training, and he could reveal that four companies that were hired to build healthcare facilities for COVID-19 had been offered contracts with no quote for their services. And the cost insurance process um, is helping to generate evidence by engaging independent experts to turn the disclosed data into compelling information that can be presented, as you can see uh, in, on your right, using easy to read infographics to help non-specialists to understand the findings. For example, in Honduras, after the publication of the second assurance report, the government decided to initiate an investigation and um, the final decision was the closure of a public body called the road phone after the evidence that we presented um, um, because of the uh, low levels of transparency and low market competition. And um, uh, then the, this investigation uh, reveals that this procuring entity was connected with organized crime. Um, 
In another report, we also helped the government to understand that a project was really causing a significant burden to taxpayers. And the, the government decided to, to stop the project and not go ahead with it because of the, of the uh, damage that the project will cause to the local communities around it. Um, the government is also using the evidence from, from the recent report and he is, uh, the government is reforming the unit responsible for commissioning the second generation of PPPs after um, the understand that uh, the previous unit was not acting according to best practices. In addition, in other examples, the Afghan Minister uh, uh, of Transport used the evidence of the first assurance report to create a new unit inside the ministry. And this new uh, unit was in charge of review the designs of the projects, saving worth 8.3 million US dollars with this process. Then um, in the second assurance report, uh, using the evidence, the ministry has changed the bidding criteria to encourage local participation following the evidence from the second report, as I mentioned, uh, that is highlighting the lack of competition from local companies. And besides our uh, four cost features, and as part of the call to build back, back better, um, COS has begun to work towards more sustainable infrastructure through new innovations, including INFRAS, which was developed by COS Honduras. INFRAS is the acronym of sustainable infrastructure, but is used in Spanish. So uh, this is um, uh, a prototype, it's a platform right now that will connect infrastructure data with environmental and social inclusion data helping to identify opportunities to ensure trans infrastructure is resilient to the impacts of climate change and it is built in a sustainable way. This platform presents an analysis in four areas of sustainable infrastructure, including financial, institutional, environmental, and social dimensions. The online uh, version, uh, the, the, the one that we can visit, will be launched officially at the end of June this year. And as a final example of innovation from our members, uh, uh, this is coming from uh, COS Uganda, that is working with the Business Integrity Initiative in UK in a project aiming to increase competition in doing business and to a strength transparency in procurement processes of infrastructure projects. Basically, what they are doing is to promote engagement with the private sector associations in Uganda, the biggest ones, and they are together influencing reforms for fair business, um, discussing findings based on disclosed data via stakeholder forums and high level engagements meetings. Cos Uganda is helping to change the narrative from where bribes are seen as an opportunity to win bidding processes to one which shows that business integrity is more beneficial and saves money. At the end of the project, early this year, Cos Uganda could demonstrate that they are helping to improve trust in the procurement processes and in the partnership amongst businesses government and civil society organizations. This is reflected on data showing low, co low competition per tender in 2019 and an increased competition per tender in 2021. Thank you. Okay. I, I, will, I will summarize just the, the main impacts that I have. Um, yes, sir. Uh, highlighted um, during my presentation. Um, basically, the cost approach um, uh, and the tools, the innovative tools that we have developed has increased some transparency and we could help governments to disclose data more than 
uh, 40,000 infrastructure investment. Um, this uh, has helped in Thailand to lower bid prices, uh, bid prices resulted in savings of 460 million US dollars. Uh, 400. Uh, Honduras, uh, we, we can see the findings uh, of the, infra, the assurance report. Uh, this is, those are helping to close, that, like me, my example, a corrupt uh, institution and ensure sustainability in some of the projects. In Afghanistan, we have a new unit, it's an institutional reform that is helping to save uh, funds. And then we have <clears throat> uh, also changes in the bidding criteria from, from the Ministry of uh, in, uh, Transport. In Uganda, uh, we are helping to, to improve trust and, and fair businesses practices and increase the bidder tender from 1.6 in 2019 to 12.5 uh, in 2020. Um, I will stop here because I know I am running out of time. So uh, sorry, because the last one I was like. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn Hernandez. There will be a chance in the Q&A and maybe questions will help you expand some of the case studies and the initiatives you just shared. Uh, I would also like to point out to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please send them in the Q&A box or, or, or in the chat box, if, if you prefer, because they, it will help us in the Q&A session. Uh, again, thank you, Evelyn. And the final uh, short presentation of tonight will be of Professor uh, George uh, Ofori. And if you would mind uh, introducing his presentation. Yes, so, so, so the, the chairman has reminded me that my presentation has to be short, and so it will be short. <laughs> uh, but I, I have written a four page paper, which I'll give to my colleagues in course, and perhaps they'll put it on the website. Um, my, 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 my task is to um, speak to those of you who are researchers and to remind you that we actually have a role to play as researchers in trying to meet the, um, the, 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 the big question or the big questions that um, you know, Richard Cullen um, highlighted in the beginning. Um, the, the main point is that we have, in fact, infrastructure, which is a strategic requirement in every economy, all right? And we have an industry that delivers it, which has a reputation of not, um, not you know, not not having good practices. Um, Richard mentioned corruption, and he stayed very much on South Africa, where we can say that it's actually a global problem. It's a global issue, and this is seen in many reports: reports by the World Bank, reports by the OECD, reports by Transparency International. And there is a, one particular report done in 2011. And this for researchers, I think is useful. It's called the Bright Payers Index. And this is where they rank companies when they go overseas um, from different countries, all right, and also in different sectors. And they found that construction if like, is, is the worst when it comes to you know, un unfair, not good, uh, improper practices, um, basically corruption, all right? And so we have a, an industry that should actually be delivering projects that are required to meet the needs of society, the needs of the economy. At the same time, we have an industry that is, if like, hamstrung by corruption. So how do we get over this? And this is why I say those of us who are researchers actually have a contribution to make, to try to actually unpack this big problem, as Richard called it, you know, this wicked problem. And I think those of us in academia, we have um, three, uh, if you like, um, responsibilities. The first one is research to try and find out where these major, major issues come from, to try to understand them, to try to propose this. Okay. The next thing that we, that we need to, to be doing is actually to, to teach. And, and in, in the teaching that we do, I, I want to challenge us by hoping and wanting to create a situation where those who graduate from the courses that we, we provide consider ethics to be very much a routine thing. It's not something that they have to think twice about doing, but very much a routine thing. So what I'm saying is whether we can, you know, can have a, a situation where um, competence of a professional actually means also that this professional is ethical and this professional is, you know, service oriented and meaning to do what they can for society. Okay. And, and my, my colleague Evelyn um, very much mentioned 
um, cost, the infrastructure transparency initiative, and what cost has been doing around the world. As researchers, also, we must be aware that there are other initiatives trying to address the same thing. Um, some of them uh, just have also the same, um, if you like, uh, the same aim of reaching or uh, attaining transparency as well. There are integrity pacts. There are um, institutions, professional institutions wanting to uh, move their members towards professional ethics. And there are, in fact, countries like Malaysia, where, in fact, uh, they have a program called the National um, the Program of National Ethics, trying to, um, the actually a requirement that the contractor must go through it and, and a course in ethics before they are registered. Okay, there are many um, non-government organizations which are involved in trying to bring about um, a situation where we have less corruption. And there are many international agreements and many international codes. So as researchers, the question is this, which of these, for example, is practical, which of these is best, which of these is good? We need to be doing you know, analysis. We need to be comparing these. We need to be trying to understand them. We need to be trying to see whether either individually or in comparison, you know, they actually work, you know, they work better in different contexts and so on. We need to understand these. All right. Uh, I was going to say unfortunately, but but I will say, um, well, sadly, the situation is that we have not yet paid as much attention to the to this issue as we should, because if we have uh, you know um a segment of the economy which is so important in, in, you know by way of infrastructure and if it is so necessary and if at the same time also we have a situation where we know that practices in it are not good then we as researchers have this responsibility to be to be addressing this issue and we have not been doing so okay and also in our teaching we i don't think we have given the idea of ethics the attention that it deserves so these are things that we should be starting to think about. And I'll just um, go back and talk about what uh, Evelyn um, has been talking to us about, the cost program. So on the cost program, um, what, what data do we have? Uh, I'm sorry, what information do we have? And at this point, we find that we really, we really have no excuse by saying that we don't have information. Because on the cost program, firstly, we have a, a huge amount of data. Now, this data, again, as Evelyn um, reminding, reminded us, has also been subjected to assurance. Assurance is an independent review of the data, and um, matters of concern would have been expressed, and so on. Just last year, in 2020, I was looking at Evelyn's slides, close to 20,000 projects have been um, disclosed, and um, many of them have been assured around the world. So we have data for doing our research. We also have this data in many cases in digitized form. And so analyzing them is if, if like we're given if like the first few steps in analyzing them. All right. We also have situations where some of some, some countries have actually been applying the cost um, initiative over a number of a number of years. And so if like we have time-based data for trying to find out in, in you know many, many aspects of, of, of this initiative and also many aspects of efforts to try to reduce mismanagement and corruption. Many aspects of, um, of how citizens have been involved and various other things as well. I'll be coming to those later on. And then Evelyn was telling us about the Infrastructure Transparency Index. This is a, a fantastic tool that um, being, being a member of the COST board, I'm very, very proud about. And I've actually said this before, um, because I think it helps us to, you know, to, to if you like uh, use this as a way of, uh, if we haven't got there yet, but I think it will come soon. And I think researchers would should be, uh, you know, interested in this. How this tool would uh, could perhaps eventually become a benchmark, similar to the um, the World Economic Forum's uh, competitiveness uh, indices, similar to the Doing Business uh, Index of the World Bank, and so on. Okay. On a broader level, uh, the question that we could ask ourselves is this. Um, remember, Evelyn said multi-stakeholder working, and if I, Richard also mentioned that, it's a very, very important part of it. In, in, you know, the question is, um, you know, to what extent is it effective? What are some of the difficulties? What are some of the issues? How can we really make it work? In what context does it succeed? And where does it not work? All right. The next issue is, is this. We say, um, Transparency is useful. We say cost is, is beneficial, but um, how do we actually uh, show its, uh, its real use to society so that governments 
uh, well, societies are willing to actually fund these, pro uh, these programs. So I'm, I'm talking about the need to do research to establish and investigate the viability and the sustainability of these approaches. For example, how to finance them as well. Ne then comes the environments in which they, these models will, will thrive. And finally, um, you, you know, the cost perhaps doesn't, or none of these initiatives have to, has to be an, an island. It could perhaps be that they should be, you know, um, brought together, not, in, not as one, but, uh, you know, as a combination of them to, to work uh, before they would work. Okay. There have been some attempts at, at some of these issues, and I, I want to commend um, my, some of my colleagues in, in COST. And they, they have done papers which have, they have presented at conferences. And the conference that um, they presented the paper at was the International Conference on Professionalism and Ethics in Construction in 2018, where the paper on cost actually won the best, the best paper award. And last year in December, I, I gave a lecture in, um, in, in Melbourne, uh, the Ozone Lecture, where I was looking at the, you know, um, the current situation that we have and how, Evelyn, as Evelyn was saying, there is the temptation to be awarding projects actually using emergency legislation. And <clears throat> therefore, what do we do in situations like this? And how, in fact, COST actually has um, proposed a way of addressing it. And Charlotte, another colleague here, has actually written a paper uh, which was published in, um, in, in the civil in, in the proceedings of the institution, institution of civil engineers. Um, it, it, the title, if you, if you want to, is called A New Index Aims to Improve Infrastructure Transparency in a Post-COVID World. Okay, and, and again, my two colleagues, John Hawkins and, and Maria Prado, have written a paper on the entire cost program. Um, I will re recommend these two papers to you. And I'll, I will finish off in, in maybe two minutes, and I'll just highlight to you also areas where in many, many um, subjects, in fact, um, the idea of transparency, the idea of anti-corruption, the idea of mismanagement actually you know, could, be, could be explored. Could be explored in construction, engineering, and the area of infrastructure and built environment. So many, many areas, uh, many, many subjects could be explored there, all right? It could be explored in sociology, for example, in building capacity for the social accountability that um, you know, Evelyn was talking about, and stakeholder collaboration, stakeholder management is also key. And in the area of business management, um, we can talk about um, the question is, we have cost, I, I think it's a fantastic initiative, but is it possible to build a business um, out of it? Okay. And when it comes to the area of law, um, many countries actually have a, a mandatory disclosure requirement and other countries have freedom of information uh, legislation. Which of these is better, for example? Then comes the question, cost we have, you know, we, we keep saying it's actually meant for public projects, but is it possible to maybe, um, you know, extend it to private projects? What, what kind of legal instruments are required? Okay. And here researchers can actually help us. And I'll finish off by talking about cost also being possibly uh, useful to colleagues in political science. And um, here, actually, I don't need to say very much, but just to highlight the fact that uh, there's been a PhD study done um, at, at the Department of Political Science, which is hosting us tonight, um, <clears throat> looking at um, how the multi-stakeholder groups of cost in 11 cost countries have actually, you know, how, how, how they have worked, some of the ways in which they collaborated, some of the ways in which perhaps they competed, um, how they, they formed media decisions, and how, um, in fact, um, you know, with more flexibility, um, it, 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 you know, it, it could be a situation where it, the system actually works instead of having a fixed approach to it. All right, and I'll end by saying that, um, you know, we as researchers, we as educators have a huge responsibility. Firstly, to bring about a generation which is, um, you know, which is very much focused on trying to minimize and if possible, reduce uh, the, 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 the huge thing that um, Richard mentioned at the beginning, reduce corruption in infrastructure, a very, very tempting, um, well, an area where it is really very tempting and perhaps it, some people find it totally unavoidable not to be corrupt. Okay. Well, how we can actually stop that uh, through the people that we educate. And the, the second thing is as researchers, how we can actually contribute to bringing about um, 
you know, the confluence between good performance and meeting the needs of society uh, through well-performing infrastructure. Yes. So, so I'll end here, but I will, I will um, maybe uh, recommend to you the COST website. And um, the COST website has, you know, fantastic resources, but also recommend to you um, a, a document that uh, Evelyn showed very quickly is the COST business plan. 2020, 2025, I think it's a very useful document. And I suggest that you also have a look at that. And finally, there's, there's been um, the cost annual report just recently published. Just have a look at that. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to me. And um, yeah, I'll hand you back to the chairman. Thank you, Professor uh, Ofari. And now it's, it's the Q&A and the debate session of tonight's event. We already have received a couple of questions, but please feel free, to, uh, all the other uh, participants and attendees, to, to write any other uh, question. Uh, the first question was written by uh, Bubelwa Kaiza, sorry for any mispronunciation tonight, uh, which is comparing uh, cost to another initiative of the uh, extractive industry accountability. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I think the questions that uh, the participant asked are related to uh, if any of the cost initiatives have uh, impacted the, the legislation of the countries. They give examples of how this initiative impacted Tanzania, Nigeria, and Liberia. And how do you look at the issue of cost sustainability uh, in, in the implementing uh, countries? So uh, I'll hand it back to the, the cost members of the board and also Evelyn, the, the, the manager. Uh, about the impact and uh, if I'm correct, the impact and legislation of, of different countries or promoting a new legislations and how do you look at the issue of cost uh, and then sustainability in, in the implementing countries? Okay. Maybe okay. Evelyn can start and then I'll pass yes, to George. Yes. And, and that's right. Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, for the disclosure part or feature, we recommend that uh, we promote the, a formal disclosure requirement that is basically a legal mandate to disclose, to reinforce what is um, the um, access to information um, uh, or freedom of information laws in every country. So we can really um, close the gap between what is required now in, 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 in transparency and then how to improve that using different legal mandates. And in some countries, um, like in Guatemala, we have a very strong legal mandate in, in the budget law, in the procurement law, in, the, in different uh, regulations to uh, promote and to mandate disclosure using our standards. And referring to the second question about sustainability, what the, our aim is to institutionalize the four uh, core features and uh, we are achieving that in different countries like in Guatemala this is one of the, 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 the ones working for more than uh, 10 years now and they have um, a new program where the civil society organization is in charge of promoting social accountability and they have their own uh, programs following the example of uh, developed by uh, COS Guatemala. And in other countries, we are promoting the authority, the access to information or freedom to information authority to verify disclosure data and to measure um, if the procuring entities are complying or not with the legal mandates. Examples like this, um, uh, we don't have a, like a program that is graduated from, from the institutionalizing the cost approach, but we are in the process of, of, of doing that. And, and maybe Evelyn, just to expand on this question, maybe could you mention some of the countries uh, to some of the members that you mentioned, uh, Guatemala, of course, uh, Uganda, if you could expand just so our members know where cost is, or, or is involved more directly. If you don't mind. Yes, yes, of course. We have uh, in, in, um, in our programs eight in Latin America. We are working in the state of Jalisco, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, uh, Ecuador, and the city of Bogota in Colombia. We are working in Uganda, Malawi, 
uh, Ethiopia, uh, Ghana in the in the region called Secondita Corari, and in Mozambique. And in Europe, we have a program in Ukraine, and in Asia, we have a program in Afghanistan, in West Lombok, Indonesia, and Thailand. And recently, um, we approve a new member is Timor Leste, but we are waiting for the public announcement of the of the program. If, if other panelists and board members uh, want to expand uh, on that, on impacting legislation or issues. Uh, Chair, can I come yes, at that? Yes, Belwa's interesting question from a slightly different angle because she draws a, a direct comparison with EITI. Yes, and indeed, yeah. EITI was a, a trailblazer in terms of transparency, multi stakeholder, international initiatives. And cost, and I remember this from the design years, the formative years, did draw on a lot of EITI's methodology and approach, but it also sought to distinguish itself. And one way it distinguished itself was by having what one might call greater devolution, so that there was more power in the member countries to design processes and practices according to contextual local needs, whereas EITI has always been rather top down from Oslo. The other thing is an important one is the difference in theory of change or the impact of theory of change. And if I can theorize briefly, so with EITI, the theory of change is that greater transparency will create political space for people in country to argue that the proceeds from oil and gas industries will be spent on health, education, and so on. Now, the, the theory of change, the links in that theory of change are complex and precarious and, and hard to prove, the causatory line. And that's why the, re, the, the reviews of EITI have tended to say it's been strong on transparency, but weak on accountability. Whereas cost, I think, is strong on both. Because as Evelyn rightly pointed out, as soon as you get that information, it creates uh, almost an immediate reaction. If you expose through the multi-stakeholder process and the disclosure regime that money has been wasted or overspent or whatever, there is an immediate opportunity to correct that. And the corrections have, in many cases, come. So the, the, the theory of change is much a much tighter one in terms of the relationship between transparency on the one hand and accountability and remedial action on the other. And that's why uh, cost may not be as expansive as uh, Bubelwa puts it in her in her question, in terms of range and countries and even noise uh, and, and impact, but it's narrower and I would argue deeper from what I've seen. And George, you're absolutely right. We need more research on this. The Academy needs to step up and do the empirical research to support the kind of theorizing that I've just offered, but also the practice and the growing praxis that Evelyn spoke to. So I agree with you, George. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if George wants to add anything. If not, I'll, I'll no, no, I think I think my colleagues have actually said uh, said it all. But I mean, so so I, I just you know, I just um, reinforce what what Richard has just said. So he, he was talking about the theory of change of, of, of the two initiatives, you know, here. But there are also other initiatives which also have different approaches. So as researchers, we have this responsibility, I think, you know, to really, you know, unpack these these approaches as to what they they are intending to achieve. How they've achieved them, the issue of sustainability, the issue of you know vitality, and you know the ability of countries to actually afford these initiatives as well. And these are things that we should be wanting to learn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the following question is asking about uh, of uh, Lika Ra Rafaba is asking what's the current role of the World Bank in supporting or expanding the work of cost, and are there any other multilateral organizations playing a role in this regard? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll start maybe with the same order, Evelyn, and then <laughs> our two others, yes. Yeah. Well, the bank has approved recently um, an umbrella trust fund, uh, and we are part. Cost is part of the a window in that in that trust fund, so we can um, now mobilize uh, funds from bilaterals and and use those uh, th that trust fund to support. The operations in the in the offices in the bank to include cost as part of the their the, the operations the, the the regular projects that they have in country and also to support the international secretariat um, also the bank has an observer a permanent observer in the board and and we have been working together for a long time 
uh, in some countries like in mine, um, we could start the, the program because of the, the, the support from the bank. We have been working with them, uh, developing some tools uh, together. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's different in, in, in different countries, but in general, uh, at the international level, we have the support from the bank. Yeah, there's, there's a follow-up question. I think it's related to that about the collaboration with FIDIC in, in, uh, in, in areas, yeah, and, and to expand a bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, I was going to give the example of Mozambique, mm -hmm. where, you know, after the huge cyclone uh, in 2019, uh, the World Bank, actually uh, was quite instrumental in arranging for the support, but also suggested that Mozambique could uh, use cost to bring about if like discipline in the way in which the, the funding was, was disbursed, the funding was actually spent to build back better or, or, or maybe um, as Richard said, to build back differently uh, you know, from what it was. So um, World Bank has been very supportive of cost and has been very, um, has, has been involved in it right from the beginning, uh, actually at, at one stage was funding part of it, uh, but currently is like a facilitator. And as Evelyn said, is actually um, has, has put together a multi-donor trust fund to help the initiative, yeah. Thank you. I don't know if uh, Richard wants to uh, elaborate in that. Uh, so, nothing, yeah. Okay. Nothing to say on that. <laughs> yeah, there's, a couple, uh, there's a couple in the Q&A. Exactly, that, uh, indeed, yeah, indeed. But, uh, Let's see if we can. Yes. So there's a more straightforward question uh, of, of the audience. Susan Brown Schaff is asking the example of the PhD uh, dissertation. We can ask to contact uh, contact us directly, and we might send yeah, exactly. a, a link. Yes. Uh, okay. You know, with that with that PhD to to our yeah. emails, you'll find it in in the websites. Yeah. Uh, th there's a question which I think maybe it's more slightly more academic. It's also related to cost, which is how does the cost like add the uh, ideology caption create a balance between corruption, political net, uh, nepotism, and how it relates to infrastructure delivery in countries such as Nigeria, where the <laughs> politics dictates infrastructure delivery for the people. So it's going back to that big debate about corruption, infrastructure delivery, transparency, and the cultural element of that. Yeah. So, so, so perhaps I should take this one. Um, so so the, if like the main, the main idea of cost is this, that data, you know, as Evelyn was trying to explain, that information on projects is actually disclosed at various stages. So there's no hiding what, what has been, you know, or, or, or if like what has happened on the project. And that um, at a certain stage, an assurance process takes place. An independent group comes to look at the data that has been disclosed by what we call the procuring entity, and then to see whether there is any area where you know things haven't gone as they should, and to express therefore some some causes of concern. Uh, what we are what we are saying is that if people who are involved in projects know that sooner or later what they do is going to be disclosed, then they will pause. Okay, when they're doing anything before they do it, because uh, the question is whether they would be able to stand when what they do is actually found out in public. Yeah. And I think this will work in any society. It doesn't, yeah. So uh, so the, I, the examples of uh, nepotism, political corruption, and various other things as well, uh, I think this is the antidote. And, and this is why I think as researchers, we really, we really have to try to understand this and try to see how um, this initiative can actually cut through um, many of those areas where uh, I would say where um, corruption has actually become very much endemic. I'd like to slightly expand on this topic and maybe Richard can also uh, answer on that. So in lots of these countries, and he mentioned specifically state capture, there's a, a close involvement of some particular companies and funders, so many times related to nepotism and all that. How do you believe these transparency initiatives can also affect the supply side of corruption? So the, 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 the construction company and its rivals, how, how can you disrupt that market by offering more transparency? In infrastructure projects? Well, I think I think it depends uh, if I can try and answer that difficult question. Yes, it's very right. <laughs> And obviously the practitioners like Evelyn can yes. report on the yes, actual uh, way in which cost has achieved this or, or not, is to make it the only game in town, is, is in a sense to, uh, in a, in a, through a process, create a kind of certification that unless you are part of the cost process, 
you're not really going to get a look in or you shouldn't get a look in. Uh, in other words, it should be a way of, of, of um, protecting the integrity of the procurement process and the decision-making process. So the private sector actors who are entirely dodgy and have malintent will not be able to get into the game and not be able to even uh, uh, bid for procurement if they have not subscribed to and have uh, either directly or indirectly uh, joined the club of cost and therefore uh, accepted its, its principles and rules. Whether it works quite like that in practice, uh, I, I'm not sure, Evelyn can no doubt correct me, but that's how I would see it. And that's how I would answer it. And that's how I would hope that a, a, an institutional mechanism, governance mechanism such as cost could address the, the very real world problem you've just uh, put to me. Maybe yeah, we're explaining that Evelyn can add some of the tools or the ways to include both the private sector or different governments in, in this transparency initiative yes. that cost has developed. Yes, yes. Uh, I, what I can see uh, working with multi stakeholder groups is that they recognize at some extent that they are part of the problem, but also they are part of the solution. Uh, so working together is, uh, is the idea of the multi stakeholder group, um, because we have an interest in common that is really um, use transparency and accountability to respond to people's needs. Uh, to deliver better uh, infrastructure and, and, and to respond to, 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 yeah, to what we uh, as, as citizens need. Thank you. We have a, a final question, again, asking, I think, about collaboration of costs and in other institutes. And they were asking about the collaboration with the International Federation of Consulting Engineers specifically. Uh, and maybe it's worth also pointing out other kind of these in trade bodies or certifications that you collaborate yeah maybe if we can start again by Evelyn and then we can talk about the other acad academic collaborations which we clearly are part of yeah we received the public endorsement of uh, FIDIC uh, I think it was last year 2019 um, in a global conference and then we have a representative in the cost board from from FIDIC and they are, they are representing the private sector. So uh, this is the type of collaboration we organize and we try to, uh, to participate in their events and they, the, the, the members of PIDIC in our events. So um, we are promoting cost among the um, membership of PIDIC. As, as you can see tonight, there's three universities, or at least uh, academics from three universities and representing UCL. Uh, uh, the, the Bartlett Institute of Sustainable Construction, but also the Glo Global Governance Institute, which is multidisciplinary, but we also have George Afar in the London South Bank uh, University, also uh, Richard Callan in the University of Cape Town. So as uh, Professor Afari mentioned, there's a call for academics to study more and, and yes. uh, institutions such as cost and initiatives that should provide the data that we can elaborate and later on theorize as also Professor Callan mentioned uh, how to develop theoretically and then institutions like cost can help us implement and actually validate lots of these theories and models that we might be discussing within our club as sometimes we'd like to refer to that yes. i would like to know if there's any final question or comments uh, from either our speakers or the audience yes. please go ahead Yes, so, so, so I was going to add to the, um, the answer that the answers that were given to the private sector um, involvement in cost, if you like, or how or does, what does cost mean yes. in the private sector? Yes. So um, I attended a meeting of the regional one, the regional managers of cost, and um, I thought it was very interesting that in one Latin American country, uh, the, pra the prof professionals went to the cost uh, country program and said they want to be trained. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I'll leave it there. So right. when we get to that position where professionals are wanting to be trained in cost, I think we'd have made huge progress. It's a good day. There's a demand also coming from these, these practitioners on that side. Uh, there's, I think, a final question, and then I'm going to wrap, uh, of uh, Sarah uh, Hijakazemi. Is there any evidence that post-evaluation of projects can contribute to reducing corruption? Are the World Bank projects less prone to corruption? I would, I would apply that to the cost projects that you are, yeah, you are working with with the World Bank. 
So yes, if, if any of the panelists has any uh, feedback on that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe I can start and just mentioning um, that, yes, we analyze different type of um, the different stages where the projects are and they could be at the inception or the identification phase or they can, they can be completed. And there is a value of analyzing data from uh, completed projects. And we can use examples from that particular one to uh, promote reforms, to avoid if there is an issue of concern um, of a complete, uh, completed project, um, to avoid repeating those mistakes or issues in, in, in a sector level or opportunity level. And we have discovered some, some issues around uh, projects funded by multilateral banks. I won't say exactly the name of the bank but, and the country, but we have um, presented it in our reports, um, some issues around um, the same bank uh, funding a, a project to different uh, procurement entities in the same country. So they have twice the amount for, for the same project. Yeah, and we could highlight that. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Callan has shared some of different academic uh, papers here on, on, on the topic for, for the students or the participants interested in, in, in studying a bit more. You can, as I mentioned, you can contact us individually or cost. Uh, just answering as an academic to this question about the World Bank less prone to corruption, it's, there's always a sampling issue, you know, and the availability of how, how would you compare World Bank projects versus national projects? <laughs> But this is part of the, the questions and, and data access and transparency we're trying to increase within, uh, within the different countries. I would like to ask if there's any final remarks uh, uh, from any of the panelists. We are, we are getting here to the uh, Charlotte Broid uh, from Costa shared some of the reports too that Evelyn was mentioning too. There's also a mailing list that you could join. But I would just like to ask if there's a final, very brief uh, comment that Professor Fari, Mrs. Hernandez, or Professor Callan would like to, to share before we close tonight. Well, because I was the last to speak, maybe I should be the first to, to, yeah. to say a few words, and then my colleagues can, can you know, add to it. Uh, uh, well, I, I just want to repeat my call to my fellow academics, um, you know, researchers and, and teachers. Um, let us try and bring up a new generation of, if you like, ethical and um, well, and and service oriented, as I said, um, practitioners who will make the this idea of uh, transparency and cost very much uh, uh, this idea of transparency very much part of them, and therefore will not be surprised if they are required to actually show their work, and therefore will make instruments like cost redundant. So I'm working towards uh, something that I'm involved in becoming redundant in future, but only, be, only because what I've done in my day life has made it so. Thank you, Professor Callan, and I'll leave Evelyn from Costa the final, yeah, speak. Quite right, Chair, she should have the last word. She is doing yes. the real work on the front line <laughs> for which we should all be grateful. Um, nothing much to add, I've, I've been typing frantically. I've answered two of the questions in the Q&A yeah. with, with typed answers. One of them was very interesting about whether really uh, my argument at the outset that something like cost could influence policy, not just accountability and transparency, but where uh, could it create a voice? My argument would be well, if, it, if it works well, part of the consensus finding standard setting role that an MSG, a multi-stakeholder group can play is in terms of policy direction. It can it can say, you know, infrastructure that meets certain green or, or sub resilient sustainability standards have to be part of the procurement process, or it can correct um, procurement choices that do not uh, conform with the climate science and other imperatives uh, facing the particular uh, context. Um, apart from that, there's a fascinating question from Jacqueline Glass, the first one about skills and leadership and infrastructure, but it's, it's far too difficult to answer at this time of, time of day, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, so I'm not going to attempt to. I simply note it as a very good question for us to all think about. What are the necessary skills for leadership in the infrastructure space? I, I don't know the answer. I'd need to think hard <laughs> about it, but uh, thank you for that and all the other questions and comments and for the opportunity to be part of this really interesting, excellent debate. Thank you.
Thank you for, again, for all the questions in the Q&A box. As you've seen, they have been answered separately while the panel was being discussed. Uh, it's accessible for everyone. And I'll give the final words of today's events to, to Evelyn before I just do a very quick closure. Yeah, thanks, uh, Armando. Uh, I maybe just highlight the link between the academia and cost. In some of our members, we have universities as, uh, as uh, representatives from the academia sector, like in El Salvador or in Costa Rica, where the University of Costa Rica is helping to develop the assurance report. And uh, uh, so I will invite to continue the link with you, uh, UCL and other universities and other um, um, yeah, uh, looking for initiatives working together, like the one that we recently finished around the multi-stakeholder working. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. If you have any other final question you didn't think was fully addressed or you'd like, uh, you think later on, please contact uh, our emails, our institutional websites and cost. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the audience, the speakers, also people that worked behind the scenes. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank you, uh, Charlotte Broid, Julia Cranecamp, uh, uh, Antonio Reyes, all the other research of the Global Initiative and Costs. Also to the UCL Global Governance Institute and my colleagues from the Barford School of Sustainable Construction are joined tonight. And uh, this is a very relevant and important topic. We hope this is the first of several initiatives uh, uh, of the kind. There's lots to be discussed both in policy, practice and, and in academia. So we hope that there's lots of follow-up initiatives uh, trying to bridge the gap between very practical and important initiatives such as costs and academics like us that try to have an impact in, in the real world. So anyway, thank you very much for everyone attending tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank